Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of all of the folks involved in the ministry of Bible Talk, I want to welcome you in Jesus' name today. As we continue on in our study of Paul's letter, the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Uh, this is our 13th time. It's the 13th study that we've done in this letter, this wonderful, wonderful letter to, to that church. A powerful, effective church it was at that time, I'll tell you what. So we're going to pick up where we left off last week. And we left off, we were in chapter 4, and we we're in verse 19. And that's where I'm going to pick up again now. But first, let me do this. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to gather in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, to gather in him who is the Word, the Word made flesh who dwelt among us, to gather trusting, Lord, that your Spirit will lead us into all truth. Lord, that you put a guard over my mouth and nothing would come out of my mouth that you've not put into my heart. And Lord, that we would all be blessed and grow and become more and more like your Son, Christ Jesus, through this study of the Word. We ask you to bless it in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. All right, so as I said, I'm going to read what well, we picked, what we left off in um, 419. And I didn't quite finish that, so I want to go back to that a little bit. We were talking about um, ha having lost feelings, right? Having become callous. So we ended last week talking about apathy, sympathy, and empathy. But to be apathetic means that you have no feeling, you've lost feelings, right? And it says, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. They've given themselves over. And I just wanted to say this because I was thinking about it just before we started. I remember years ago, uh, I started my ministry a long time back in the mid-70s. And I, I did a lot of teaching and preaching, reaching out to people on the streets of New York City in Times Square, as a matter of fact, back in the 70s. And uh, so there were a lot of drug addicts. Now, I don't know an awful lot about drug addiction. I've seen the results of it, and it's not pretty. But one of the things that I've heard, and I believe to be true, and you can check on this, is that, for example, cocaine, which gives people a flash of, of whatever, this pleasure, and that's why they... The problem is that with cocaine, it kills the ability to feel pleasure. They lose their feeling. So what they were starting out to do has turned into a complete lie. And because of it, they've lost, they've lost their ability to feel pleasure. So what do they do here? Having become callous, they've given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greed. Why? They're seeking something that they don't have. So maybe in the beginning, you know, get a little rush. You think it all oh, it's all going to be, but it, it falls apart. Because the devil is a liar by nature and the father of lies. So the promises he makes, he cannot keep. And it was so here. They've given themselves over. When the Hebrews chose to worship the golden calf, remember in the wilderness? Moses had gone up the mountain and he was delayed coming down from what they wanted. So he was, while he was getting the commandments, the people below, it says that they were eating and drinking and singing and had risen up to play. That's in Exodus chapter 32. Go read it. Make, by the way, it's really a good thing if you take time, just jot down little notes so you can go back and, and have conversations with the Lord. Do your own study based on what we're saying here and doing here, right? Because it says there in Romans chapter 1, Romans 1, 24, I'm going to start at. Therefore, God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. See, what, isn't that, can you see the relationship between that and what happened out in the wilderness when they were worshiping the golden calf? Now what they're doing is they're seeking, they're trying to get a feeling, they're trying to get something here. So they chose to give themselves over. But God had given them over. You see, it was about worship, and it's still about worship today, right? In that case, it was a, a case of bad worship, worshiping something other than God, 
which was one of the commandments that God gave Moses while he was up on that mountain. The result was sexual perversion. That's what Paul is saying in Romans, right? Giving him over to a depraved mind. And now in these perilous last days, those actions, those actions of lust and greed and perversion, they become an accepted part of the world culture. And unfortunately, that's true in much of the church system. Not the true church, not the body of Christ. But it's true that there's still out there homosexuality, perversions, greed has become pretty much accepted. Not only accepted, it's literally promoted in so much of the church today, the so-called church. Well, and I'm going to move now to Ephesians 4, 20 and 21. It says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. You didn't learn Christ in this way. How did you learn Jesus? How did you learn Jesus? I mean, thank God, there are many ways that you can learn about Jesus. Hopefully through studies such as this, for an example. I mean, I hope that you're learning something about Jesus. But there's only one way you can truly learn Jesus. Not about him, but learn Jesus. And that is walking and talking with him. Being discipled by him. Hearing and obeying him. By the way, in, in Hebrew, the word to hear and the word to obey, Shema, is the same word. Because it's inconceivable to God that you would hear his voice and not act upon it, not do it, right? So you have to both hear and obey. And faith is the key. Oh, faith is always the key. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God or the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. So I pray that beyond me, listen, I, I'm here to try and encourage us all to hear the voice of God. Right? It's not about what I have to say. It's about what God speaks. And hopefully he can speak through me because he can speak through any of us. He spoke through a donkey, didn't he? Ta-da! Ephesians 4, 22, 23. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You see, if you have a new life, you have to have a new lifestyle. So you have to lay aside the old self. You can't put new wine in old skin, as Jesus said, right? Don't be conformed to this world, Paul said to the Romans. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 2. More completely, we have to change the way that we think. I mean, it's not just a matter of changing your mind. I did a lot of study on this. I think what we're doing in, in the Sermon on the Mount and perhaps in Timothy, you know, and I use the example, if I walk into McDonald's and I, I, I think I'm going to have a hamburger and I walk into McDonald's and I walk up to the counter and I say, well, now I'm going to have chicken McNuggets. I've changed my mind, but I haven't changed the way I think. Right? To change the way you think is something so, so important. We have to change the way we think about everything. If we have the mind of Christ, that's what it says in, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we have the mind of Christ. Well, Jesus, how many times in the Sermon on the Mount, which is the single most important teaching that the world has ever, ever heard? Matthew 5, 6, and 7, go read it. If you read it before, good, go read it again. And if you just recently read it, good, go read it again. You need to hear it over and over and over. Then it becomes a part of us, right? Because Jesus said, he, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, basically, Jesus is saying, you have to change the way that you think about poverty and prosperity, about prayer, about friends and foe. You have to change the way you think about everything. That's why he said over and over and over in that sermon, you have heard it said, but I say to you. We've got to learn to open ourselves to the working of the Holy Spirit 
who were sent to lead us into all truth and change the way that we think. There's so many verses, but I want you to hear this one because this may say it pretty well. <laughs> In Romans, going back to Romans chapter 13, Paul said, let us behave properly as in a day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be the goal of all of this. You understand God's goal. He is the potter and we are the clay and he is molding us and shaping us. Shaping us into what? Well, again, it goes back to Romans where Paul said that Christ, God has, for whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. He is making us like Jesus. And I've said this before. I, I'm sure, you know, you may have heard it in other places. Uh, I think it was, I always get this, Da Vinci that made the uh, statue of the, the uh, David, the statue of David. It wasn't him, it was Michelangelo. It was one of those old Italian guys. And somebody asked him, I mean, think about this. You take a block of stone, a block of granite, a block of, mar block of marble, or whatever it is, and you turn that big block into something like one of those statues they made. How do they do that? Well, they can see it. They have vision. And somebody asked him, whoever him was, and said, how do you do this? He said, I just cut away everything that is not David. That's what God is doing in our lives right now. He is cutting away from our lives anything that is not Jesus. So we wind up looking exactly like Jesus. That's a wonderful goal. And that should be the delight of your heart to be able to see you being come, becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. I just got word from uh, outside here. My darling wife, Alice, said it was Michelangelo that did the David. Good going, Michael. Angelo. <laughs> but not anything as good as what God the Father is doing in us right now. Okay. In verse 26, I'm up to chapter 4, verse 26, right? It says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Think about it. that verse requires that there must be such a thing as righteous anger. If you can be angry and not sin, that's righteous anger. And again, I'm going back to Romans and what Paul wrote there. And he said in, in the first chapter, he said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Why is it? That's because that's God's wrath. That's God's anger. He, you know, the anger of God accomplishes some wonderful things. It's cutting away the things that he doesn't like in our lives. Remember this. You know, my beloved brethren, that you know, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not accomplish or achieve the righteousness of God. James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Anytime that you start to feel anger rise up in your life, stop and think about that. You will not accomplish the righteousness of God with your anger. Period. And you know what? That's where you go back to the Sermon on the Mount and start reading on how to start hearing on how to deal with those situations where you're being attacked. Well, how do you do that? You bless those who curse you. You pray for your enemies. You love those who hate you. Because the goodness of God overcomes the badness of man. Hallelujah. But anger in our lives can never be about what is done to us. Because if you get angry something somebody's done to you, that's not righteous anger. It's unrighteous anger. So you need to hear from God and, and act responsibly, praying for that person that hurt you, blessing that person that hurt you. Remember, Jesus said, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 44. He said, I say to you, 
love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Don't get angry at them. That doesn't accomplish anything. But that doesn't mean that there's not such a thing as righteous anger. Think about this. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all of those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. Matthew 21. That's righteous anger. Jesus was not angry at what was done to him, but he was angry at what was being done to God's, that, that temple, that house of prayer. I mean, think about it. How much longer in, in time was it that all of a sudden they're tearing him down, they're torturing Jesus, they're whipping the skin off of his back, they're nailing him to a cross, and his response is, Father, forgive them. That has to be our response. But if you know, if you see somebody else being harmed, if you see something, I mean, you have to be led by the Spirit because those who are being led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God, the children of God. The next verse, Ephesians 4, 27 says, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Do you think he requires an opportunity? Well, think about it, okay? Peter wrote, 1 Peter 5, 8, he said, be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's going around, he's looking. You know, go get the Nature Channel or something and watch how they talk about when lions go out to feed. What do they do? They stalk, but they look for the weak ones. They look for the ones that separate themselves. Don't give the devil an opportunity. He's Listen, he's going to come against you. He hates you with a hate that's uh, just almost inconceivable. But remember this, God has promised, you know Psalm 23? God has promised to lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If you stay on that path, it's going to make it an awful lot harder for the devil to attack you. And the snare of the trapper in Psalm 91, let me just read something from Psalm 91 here. It says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. Psalm 91, those are the first three verses. Well, if you're on a path of righteousness, if you step off that path, you're in enemy territory and you're placing yourself in danger. How do you, why, how, why would you step off? If you know the safety and the path of righteousness, I'll tell you why, since you asked. He's the snare of the trapper. What is it? What a trapper uses a snare, and they either set him up on paths they know you travel. We well, can't do that. I don't think they're, he's allowed to set up the traps on the path of righteousness. Or they put bait out on the side, and somebody will go to the bait. Satan will use bait to try and get you off that path of righteousness where he can trap you. What's he going to use for bait? Whatever you tell him will work. He's not a mind reader. I don't believe Satan has any power to read your mind, but he can listen in, and I'm sure he does. So if your constant conversation is about this or that, you know, car or a boat or whatever it is, you're telling him how to bait the trap. And when you go, he'll, he can do that. When he puts that there as an offer to get you off the, off the path of righteousness, when you step off, you're in trouble. But God is faithful. Hallelujah. Just be, be careful about what you let come out of your mouth. Because somebody's listening all the time. I know God is listening. And you want your words to be pleasing to him. But Satan's listening because he's looking for things that he can use against you. So in Ephesians 4.29, it says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. No unwholesome word. The King James and the English Standard Version translate that Greek word, the Greek word is sapros, as corrupt. 
But the root of the word commonly used in classical Greek was translated rotten. Don't let any rotten word perceive. You know what? I you can't hardly turn on the television without hearing rotten words, unwholesome words. You can't go into a mall and wander around without hearing people using foul language, rotten language. That's the culture that we're in now, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. You know, Paul is writing in this verse, no unwholesome word, that the, the goal of our word or our words is to edify, to build up, to give grace to those who hear. That would be fulfilling what we're told to do in the letter to the Hebrews, because in the letter to the Hebrews, it says, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3.13. And remember this now, Solomon, with all of his wisdom, he wrote this, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word fitly spoken. Proverbs 25.11. Like apples of gold and so. Hmm. Do you ever hear the expression, one bad apple spoils a whole bunch? You better be careful what's going to come out of your mouth. Do not be deceived. Bad company spoils good morals. That's what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15. Something can corrupt. You know, you put. If you allow bad words to come out of your mouth, what's a bad word? You know what a bad word is. You know, I could tell you, it's like, th those are the words that my mommy would have washed out my mouth with soap for back in the day. And now, it's, it's, it's as likely that your mommy is using that same kind of language because it has become acceptable in our culture to use rotten words, unwholesome words, unedifying words. You have to be on guard. Because remember, life and death, death and life are in the power of the tongue, right? So be good company and speak life into other people and their situations. Because life and death, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You might also remember, and think about this, you know, it says let a man examine himself. What comes out of your mouth reveals exactly what is inside your heart. Stop and think about that. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what Jesus said. So if out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, what comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. Now, I don't want to sound too fanatical, but I am not in the least bit afraid to do that and remind you that the foremost command, what's the foremost command? Hear, O Israel, Shema Yisrael, I don't know where Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. With your whole heart. Well, if you're loving the Lord your God with your whole heart, then the only thing that should come out of your heart is about God, the love of God. And yes, any place you are, anything that you're doing, your, your talk, your conversation should be seasoned with the love of God, right? If, if, you're, if your constant conversation is about sports, about work, about money, about cars, movies, whatever it is, you're showing what your heart is filled with. You have the power of death and life in your tongue. That's why, listen, I know what's in you. I can tell what's in your heart when I hear you. We, we need to be on guard. We need to put a guard over our mouths. David prayed that. Ask God to put a guard over his mouth, right? If you catch yourself and all your conversation, except on Sunday when you go into the church building, is about the, the world and the things of the world, you have a significant problem. So I'm not saying it's for condemnation, but you know what? We need to be aware of what's in our heart and pray like David did. Create me a clean heart. Create me a clean heart. Get that stuff out of your heart and it'll come out of your conversation. I know what's in your heart. You tell me all the time. And it's for edification and grace. 
to be built up. That's what edifying means, to build up. And Peter wrote again, 1 Peter 2, he said, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. As long as you and I are here, here on this planet, we're being built up or we're sliding down. <laughs> it is not given the man to stay in one place. You're either going up or you're going down, but there's movement, all right? Because if there's no movement in your life, then you're stagnant. And that's, that's as bad as sliding down all the time because in Zephaniah, in the first chapter of Zephaniah, he said, it will come about at that time that I, this is God speaking to him, that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good or evil. The key to not being stagnant, stagnant is movement. Move. Be on the move for God. And remember, it's supposed to be an upward call. So be more like Christ today than you were yesterday. And purpose in your heart to be more like Jesus tomorrow than you are today. Let there be movement in your life. Don't settle for less. Don't tolerate anything in your life that is not glorifying God and building you up, right? You know, he, the next verse, 430 says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You've been sealed. I, I rejoice in this because sealed, you know, you take a can, can of something, a can of corn, and you put it there and you dump dirt all over it. You know what? Pick it up and shake it off. There's no dirt inside the can. You've been sealed. You are protected by the Holy Spirit. But I want to tell you how to work this, how to make this happen. Because Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and he said, Rejoice always, always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Quench means to put out a fire. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. That means, you know, that, to grieve means to sadden, to make sorrowful. Do you realize that when you're not doing these things, rejoicing, always praying without ceasing, giving thanks, do you not think it makes God sorrowful? The Holy Spirit was sent to us by the Father and Jesus so that we would walk in truth and in power for his glory. How sad it is to give someone a precious gift and never even see them pick it up. Is that not true? How do you think you feel? How, I, you know, I don't know God's feelings at all, but if we're not using the Holy Spirit as he intends us to do, walking in the Spirit, shame on us. David said, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And Paul wrote, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Neither you nor I or anybody else can know the truth of that or be able to do those things without the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we praise you and thank you that you have sent the Holy Spirit into our lives, into us, to be the temple of the Holy Spirit so that we have the power to do these things that you're calling us to, that we might live the fullness of life, that we might be those true ambassadors for you, that bring the knowledge of your presence into every place that we go. I thank you, Father, that you can still use us, the foolish, to shame the wisdom of the wise. Lord God, because it's not our word that we should speak, but yours. So we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Well, there goes our time once again. So until next week, I just want to I just want to pray that you walk in the Spirit for the glory of God. Amen. Bye-bye. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your